Last year I attended and was a small sponsor of the Resistance Exercise Conference put on by Luke Carlson and Discover Strength. As it says right here, I'm an alumni speaker. I think I've done four of the hour-long talks since 2011 or so. The first on congruent exercise, the last in 2014 on what became joint friendly fitness, and a couple in the middle, one on range of motion and one where I trained a couple of volunteers. For this one, I gave a table talk along with these other alumni. Highlighted, you see Roger Schwab, for whom I put together the Mentor Pictorial, Dr. Sean Proust, who spoke on Lift Heavy, which I probably should have listened to because I haven't in over 10 years since training with Roger on X-Force. That's shown on the upper right. He and I were doing a manual resistance demonstration for, I believe, Charles McMillan's keynote speech. Photo courtesy of James Fisher, who you see me thanking on the bottom right. My topic was how certain exercise designs are easier on the shoulder joints than others. I can't help but notice how many posts, videos, blogs, etc., how much instruction is put out for consumption that ignores how joints work safely. And this goes not only for influencers and wannabes, but also for those with PT or MS or PhD after their names, because apparently they're not immune from wanting to hit the algorithm lottery either. So what I tried to do here was use a couple of classic hit popular stations that have been redesigned over the years to illustrate what the biomechanics and sports medicine textbooks say about shoulder function and how to incorporate that into your exercises. A couple of disclaimers before I start. Number one, I'm going to mention brand names. I'm not endorsing a brand, I'm not criticizing a brand but I do want to use a common frame of reference. The point is not the brand because a brand that's been around for a while is going to have several different designs of the same exercises. And conversely, a particular design may be copied across several brands. The point is what the design asks of the joints and the muscles. Number two, and I'm quoting myself out of joint friendly fitness here is caveat exerciser. Any exercise can go wrong, anyone can have an accident, and anyone can have so much prior wear and tear that even doing everything meticulously can be the straw that breaks the camel's back. But just because you can't control all the variables doesn't mean you should control none of them, and your choice of exercise and how you do it is under your control. Two rules of thumb to protect your shoulders. The first is touchdown. If you keep your presses and pull downs in this plane and range, you'll do a lot to keep your shoulders healthy. Notice when anyone makes the touchdown sign, they don't move their arms in pure flexion. They don't move in pure abduction. They split the, the difference. This is the scapular plane, which has the fewest internal obstructions to moving your arm overhead. So any exercise that encourages or allows you to use this plane is easier on your shoulder joints than others. Front presses and pull downs are less likely to create impingements or bind and strain ligaments than behind the neck presses or pull downs. The second is to keep your hands in your peripheral vision. So not just on this chest press, but on any, you lower the weight, you look straight ahead, and as long as your hands are in your peripheral vision, you're probably good. Once they disappear, you have some margin for error, but you're probably on the verge of overstretching the shoulder. Now, I know the, quote, lengthened partials people probably think this is obsolete, but there are sound biomechanics and sports medicine behind not loading into hyperextension and avoiding anterior instability, pec tears, and the like. Let's start with the side raise on the old Nautilus double shoulder station. Specifically, this design has you raise your arms directly to the sides, or more precisely, abduction in the frontal plane with internal rotation. Other exercises that come close to this motion are dumbbell side raises, upright rows, especially with a barbell and a wide grip, or any other copycat stations. 
the concern is the end point. The problem is that the higher you move your elbows this way, the more likely you are to create an impingement. This applies whether you're on a weight training station or using a bar or a kettlebell or elastic or you're swimming the butterfly, martial arts, whatever. Now to be clear, this was very common instruction at the time. And Ellington Darden, who wrote this, wrote the clearest and most useful instruction at the time and still does. And his work is committed to print, unlike today's influencers. But with 40 years more wear and tear on my own joints and much easier access to sports medicine and biomechanics, I do think it's okay to revisit what we had been doing to see if it needs to be adjusted. By the way, the instruction, both arms parallel to the floor, we should have stuck with. From Brunstrom's Clinical Kinesiology, when the joint is in full internal rotation, active abduction is limited because the greater tubercle of the humerus strikes the acromion process and the AC ligament, which by definition is impingement. Now, they weren't writing specifically about bodybuilding exercises or the Nautilus double shoulder, but the general point holds. Now, on the right, this is from the Sports Medicine Guidebook, the consequences of repetitive impingement. The humerus contacts the acromion, pinching the bursa, tendons, ligaments, and the rotator cuff. The impingement leads to irritation, which leads to inflammation, which leads to internal swelling, which means less room internally, so it's easier for more impingement to happen the next time, and so on. The consequences would eventually be tendonitis, bursitis, and pain. And if unchecked, either a rotator cuff tear or a frozen shoulder. And again, this would be from repetitive cumulative impingement, not just from doing it a handful of times. Now, a simple fix would be to stop short of the impingement, going back to the parallel with the floor line. But this could be tricky for a couple of reasons. Number one, since individuals may structurally have different end ranges, you would have to check each client and instruct them accordingly. Two, the same individual older may have less range compared to his younger self or her younger self because of arthritis and other age experience related conditions. And number three, since we're not talking about an acute immediate injury, a trainee may not see the need to preemptively fix it. Uh, he or she thinks they got used to it. They think they're getting away with it, but it's cumulative along with all the other life stresses on the shoulder. And the first symptom is pain. And at that point, you probably have to get treatment or at least lay off for a while for things to calm down. A more complex fix would be to incorporate external rotation in the side raise movement. This is a great article from the June 1990 issue of Iron Man magazine by physical therapist, chiropractor, Joseph Horrigan. If you remember the biomechanics excerpt earlier, externally rotating during abduction causes the greater tubercle of the humerus to move behind the acromion and avoid the impingement. Hargan applies that concept by using an incline bench face down for side raises, which if you lift the dumbbell straight up, positions your shoulder in external rotation while keeping the side delt working directly against the resistance. Body masters and Cybex at one point made a station which did the same, but I don't believe this is common currently. Now, being face down on an incline bench where other people's head sweat was isn't for you. You can always use an elastic or a cable, one arm at a time, pulling across the body into the external rotation. The two Nautilus side raises pictured on the left don't really allow for the external rotation. So stopping short of the impingement would be the way to do these two. In practice, I know I and my contemporaries would flex our wrists at the top of the rep to try to push the pads higher and unintentionally move slightly into external rotation. But this makes the exercise very imprecise, converting a side raise to some kind of forceful wrist curl uh, in order to handle heavier weights or do more reps, not necessarily to 
make that easier on our shoulders. The MedEx on the right has adjustments below the wrist pad and grip that allow you to set external rotation for the whole repetition. So that's a big step in designing the station away from impingement. Also, if you notice, the axes on the MedEx station aren't parallel. The MedEx axes are angled closer in front than the back, and this puts the movement in the scapular plane. Now, these pages are from Basic Biomechanics of the Musculoskeletal System. Um, the scapular plane is midway between flexion in the sagittal plane and abduction in the frontal plane, which I described as touchdown. Um, flexion extension is limited by the capsule, specifically the ligaments going taut. Abduction is limited by the impingement. The scapular plane, quote, is considered more functional because in this plane, the inferior portion of the capsule is most lax and the musculature of the shoulder is optimally aligned for elevation. MedEx used the scapular plane for the pullover, side raise, press, and pull down. Later Nautilus overhead presses had the handles extend farther forward than the press side of the old double shoulder, which was more of a press behind the neck setup. If you don't have these stations, scaption with dumbbells, the thumbs up raises, presses to the front of the neck, pull downs and chins to the front, all use this plane. Here are my instructions for the incline side raise and press on the top, and my warnings about the upright row and the press behind the neck on the bottom. These are from the print version of Joint Friendly Fitness. Um, that and the shoulder and arms Kindle cover four more shoulder exercises this way. And then we ran out of time for the table talk. So in assessing for yourself whether some proposed new exercise is a good idea or not, start by trying the movement without load, like the impingement movement or moving overhead outside of the scapular plane. If the movement is difficult or hurts without a load, then the load isn't what makes the exercise challenging. It's the fact that you're just putting your joints in an awkward position. And more often than not, that's not a great idea, at least if you want to keep your joints healthy. Elsewhere on this channel, you'll find these playlists. Please feel free to watch and subscribe. And my books on Amazon. The next video coming in March will be my breakdown of lengthened partials. Spoiler, it's not going to be favorable with reasons.